Assalamualaikum and a very good day I'll be to the lecturers. We are from group 5A. We're going to present our PIT cases which is bronchopneumonia, meningitis and pertussis. For the first part of our patient data, our patient is male Malay that born prematurely at 32 weeks on 6th of January 2020. His current weight is 2.2 kilo with no height or BMI is recorded. On the second part of patient data, for the shift complaint and history presenting illness, the patient developed cough for 4 days that shows a dry cough with intermittent SOB, chesty cough and accompanied with post to see vomiting 3 times which have meat content with no bile or blood on it. Next, patient have bluish discoloration of lip for one episode at 3.45 p.m. His last breastfeed was on 11 in the morning with no choking or vomiting prior to that and preceded by chest cough followed by limb and bluish discoloration of lip which resolved after taping the back for one minute. The patient was brought to emergency department immediately and during the 12 minutes journey, the child was limb with off and on opening eyes. Other than that, he has diarrhea for 2 days with total episode of 4, which are loose stool at minimum amount, yellowish and no blood. The patient was lethargy since night and he is sleep most of the time. Also, the patient feeding is reduced for 2 days, which the patient usually breastfeed every 2 hours but since yesterday, the patient breastfeed every 6 hours. Moreover, Reduced urine output is also seen in this patient as the patient only changed his diaper only for 3 days today which usually occur every 3 hours but there is no false smelling urine. Lastly, no fever, running nose or rapid breathing on this patient including no inconsolable cry. There are no past medical and medication history is recorded on this patient. On the third part of patient data, for family history, his father is 37 year old that worked as a technician while his mother is 35 year old and worked as a teacher. Moreover, the patient is the youngest sibling and no family history of genetic or metabolic disorder. His parent marriage is non-consanguineous. On the birth history, his mother is newly diagnosed with liver mass and suspected as hepatocellular carcinoma. Other than that, his mother is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes mellitus with bilateral retinopathy, nephropathy and currently on insulin and OHA. For the patient, the patient is delivered through C-sections due to fatal distress. Thus, the patient is delivered prematurely at 32 weeks with corrected gestational age of 37 weeks 3 days with birth weight of 1.8 kilo. The patient also have respiratory distress syndrome and have been given surfactor for 2 times. Also for this syndrome, the patient was on intermittent positive pressure ventilation for 2 days and then converted to non-invasive ventilation. He was on total oxygen support for 3 weeks and diagnosed with IVH grade 2 and tiny pattern ductus arteriosus. His development history is appropriate to his age and he has completed his BCG and first dose of Hep B vaccine. For the first part on diagnosis and treatment, the patient is diagnosed with bronchopneumonia with the evidence of chest x-ray that shows hazardous at bilateral interstitial and also from CNS result. The CNS result is shown in the slide. It shows that the patient has positive on urine streptococcus pneumonia and then trachea aspirate with mixed growth of Klebsiella ocetoca and positive on influenza AB, parainfluenza 1, 2, 3, adenovirus and respiratory cytical virus. And for the recommended treatment that referred from the pediatric protocol and also national antibiotic guideline, for the first line, it should be given to beta-lactam with dose of 300,000 units per kilo per day, IV in 4 to 6 divided dose for 5 to 7 days. And for the second line, it can be given cephalosporin with dose of ceproxim 100 to 150 mg per kilo per day, IV in 3 divided dose, with maximum dose is 6 gram per day, or amoxicillin clavulonate 30 mg per kilo per dose IV, Q8 hours, with maximum of 1.2 gram per dose. And for the other recommended treatment, macula antibiotic should be used if either microplasma or chlamydia pneumonia is suspected. But in severe case of pneumonia, combination therapy with second or third generation of cephalosporin and macula is recommended. The second part of the diagnosis for this patient is meningitis. This is confirmed by the symptom of allergic wasting, second and terminal fortuna, vomiting and ulcer apnea. The patient also has low blood pressure on 14 and 16 of her body. And the CSFP protein of the patient show abnormality which indicates meningitis. The CNS result also shown positive threat pneumonia or genus on 15 of February. As for the recommendation of empirical treatment, therefore taxing 200 until 300 mg per kg per day IV in 4 divided doses or 
excess reagent 100 mg per kg per day IV in 1 until 2 divided doses. Sevotazine is chosen for this patient due to less interaction with calcium and bilirubin displacement. It is also recommended to add benzene penicillin 300,000 until 400,000 units per kg per day IV in 4 until 6 divided doses. Why for the directed treatment, it will rely on MIC level and be given after receiving the MIC result. The net diagnosis is pertussis, it is confirmed by cough and apnea. The recommendation treatment for this condition is oral or IV azithromycin 10 mg per kg per day for past days. The drug given to this patient is same as a guideline which is azithromycin, but the duration of treatment given to this patient is only 4 days. It is recommended to continue given azithromycin until day 5 to complete the course of treatment. There are a total of three drug-related problems for this patient. So the first DRP is the insufficient dose of benzyl penicillin for both meningitis and bronchopneumonia. The infection was uncontrolled as we can see the WBC CRP lymphocyte was above the normal range. For meningitis, on 13 of February, the patient received a total dose of 560,000 units per day, which is less than the calculated required dose of 660,000 to 880,000 units per day. For bronchopneumonia, on 17 of February, the patient received a total dose of 225,000 units per day, which is less than the required dose of 440,000 units per day. So the recommended dose were calculated based on the HITS protocol 2019 and MAG 2019. The goal of therapy is to allow the effective control of meningitis and bronchopneumonia and to return the CRP WBC lymphocyte back to the normal range. To manage this problem, we should increase the benzyl penicillin dose to 165,000 units every 6 hours for meningitis and continue the 220,000 units twice daily for bronchopneumonia. We will monitor the CNS test, the sign of infection such as the CRP, WBC, lymphocyte and temperature, and symptoms such as the SOB, coughing, pale skin, and neck stiffness. Another DRP is the unnecessary use of potassium chloride mixture. This is because patient potassium level was within the normal range. Patient pH is lower than normal. Metabolic acidosis can cause hyperkalemia. Hence, we decide to stop potassium chloride mixture to prevent hyperkalemia-related adverse reactions, such as weakness, confusion, cardiac arrest, or ventricular arrhythmia, muscular or respiratory paralysis. Potassium level, arterial blood gas, and ECG should be monitored. The third DRP is the incorrect rate of infusion for midazolam, which is 0.5 liter per hour. The drug should be administered at the lowest possible effective dose, so can reduce the potential for drug accumulation. High doses administration might cause respiratory depression, apnea, or cardiac arrest. We suggest to run 1 mL per hour and monitor patient respiratory rate, heart rate, BP, and oxygen saturation. The first pharmaceutical care issues is the risk of metabolic bone disease of prematurity. The ALP of the infant is 449 unit per liter, which is above the normal range. He has also low phosphate, which is below 2 mm per liter. There is possible risk of developing metabolic bone disease in low birth weight premature infants, which have been described in up to 10%. The management is to continue monitor patients' ALP, calcium and phosphate. It is recommended to provide oral daily intake of calcium and phosphate. Besides, it is encouraged to perform daily passive exercise on the infant. The next pharmaceutical care issue is patient at risk of developing anemia because of prematurity, poor diet due to reduced feeding and cause lethargic looking, low HB and RBC level in this patient. For the management, supplemental iron is advised to give to this patient with doses of 2 until 4 mg per kg per day, daily protein intake 3.5 to 3.6 gram per kg. At this test, give supplement with vitamin B12 and folate to avoid pathologic anemia. Moving on to other related pharmacist intervention. First is regarding patient's immunization. We notice that the baby haven't received his second dose of hepatitis B vaccine although he is already one month old. According to the pediatric protocol, vaccines can be given following the chronological age for preterm infants. 
Hence, as the intervention, we can advise the parents to get the next hepatitis B vaccine for the baby. We will educate the parents regarding the importance of vaccine to encourage them to get complete vaccination for their child. Lastly, we will provide the national immunization schedule so that the parents will be aware about the proper time to get their child vaccinated. Next is regarding the safety of breastfeeding from diabetic mother. Based on the PWDT form, we found that the mother had diabetes mellitus and are using insulin and oral hypoglycemic agent during the pregnancy. Therefore, we will ask the mother if she is currently taking any medications to determine the risk of medication exposure to the baby. We will also advise the mother to breastfeed her baby before taking medicines so that the drug concentration in the milk will be at its lowest. Lastly, we will educate the mother to monitor any signs of hyperglycemia in her baby. For the safety monitoring of medications, we will monitor the serum electrolyte since low level of electrolyte such as hypokalemia can lead to cardiac complications. The IO chart is monitored to check the hydration status. We will also monitor the infusion site and check any signs of hypersensitivity to antibiotics such as inflammation, rash and itching. We will monitor renal and liver function as they can affect the pharmacokinetics of the drugs. Respiratory and cardiac function including level of sedation and oxygen saturation also require monitoring. Lastly, we will check for signs of adverse effect which might occur from the medications. For the efficacy, we will monitor vital signs such as blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate and temperature to assess general condition of the patient. We will also monitor white cell count, neutrophil, C-reactive protein and culture and sensitivity tests to ensure complete eradication of the pathogens. Patient condition will be monitored to ensure coughing, vomiting, diarrhea and dehydration are resolved. Lastly, we will monitor the arterial but blood gases to check resolution of metabolic acidosis. These are the references used in this case. Thank you.